thank you everyone i'm very excited i hope this will be interesting i thought about how to condensate uh 10 years of artistic experimentation in 30 minutes and uh, we, we came up with a plan i'm going to present four different projects from four di different moments uh in artistic experimentation um, some very early projects and ending with the most recent one um, so four projects for moments but also four different technologies uh, uh, my work uh, focuses a lot on technology i am very interested in our relationship with technology and technological power um, and the kind of questions that can be asked through an artistic approach that tackles technology so i will be focusing on facial recognition technology on digital mapping and uh, on genotyping and artificial intelligence in these four projects it's also a way of dealing with different companies uh, the technologies that i'm tackling uh, are for example technology produced by facebook uh, uh, by google by amazon and overall what i also try to do with these four different projects is presenting four different uh, strategies or artistic methodologies that can be employed to subvert technology from within um, so let's jump back to 2012 this is one of my earliest projects it's entitled digital pareidolia personal index of facebook's erroneous portraits and as you will see i often start from things that are very personal um, so in this case i started from my own personal archive of photos 2012 was uh, the time when in Europe, Facebook was starting to implement facial recognition technology within their social media platform. I was very uh, interested and also disturbed at the same time by the possible applications of these technologies outside of the platform. And so I decided to test. Uh, and testing technology for me often means pushing technology to its breaking point, uh, trying to see what happens when we push a technique or, or a technological apparatus or even a discourse sometimes to its breaking point. And in order to test the limits of this technology, first I uploaded all of my personal photos to a Facebook account. Uh, it was 30,000 photos, which I had collected since 2005, uh, which was the time when I had bought my first digital camera. And 30,000 photos also happened to be the same amount of photos that globally were being uploaded to Facebook every 10 seconds. Um, then I started to go through every suggestion of um, facial recognition. So you can see here, for example, in the lower um, corner, there is a face and there is a little square around it. Uh, th this square usually would appear and would prompt a question uh, who is in this photo and it would ask people to tag the name of the person now it can actually do it automatically um, but at that time it required you to input the name more interesting for me was the fact that sometimes this recognition failed and so as you can see uh, in the upper part of the screen one of those squares is actually focusing on something different it's a piece of technical equipment but the facial recognition recognized it as a face. So I was interested in this idea of the wrong portrait, uh, the technology selecting something, turning it into a portrait. And what happens when we rely so much on these technologies that can also fail in such a clear way? Um, by uploading all of my photos and going through every suggestion of a tag, I was able to isolate 193 wrong portraits and uh, this is a recurrent approach in my work which is pushing technology until it fails uh, and then seeing what that failure reveals about the technology uh, the final work was shown like this it was basically a um, diagram um, i don't know if you can really see but on the right side there is an index that looked like this and the index was connected to all of these different portraits describing the content of the photos but because i could also make an estimate uh i i knew that globally uh the spatial recognition was failing at least 19 times each second and 
I think that was also an interesting way of using a very small data sample, which is also very personal, and through an artistic approach, trying to ask some questions in a way that it's both ironic, it's also a bit disturbing, and of course, it has also some aesthetic qualities. Uh, around the same time, I also produced a trilogy of works entitled the Google Trilogy. Uh, the first part of the trilogy, uh, entitled Report a Problem, was the result of traveling in Google Street View for one full year. And during my travels, I collected by screenshots, so I'm just taking a screenshot of my computer screen, um, I collected all the wrong portraits that I encountered. So we're moving from wrong portraits to wrong landscapes. Uh, there will be portraits later on, even in Google. But here, the interesting thing is that all of these images uh, represent the different kinds of glitches. Some are caused by hardware failure. Some are caused by software failure. Um, and the other interesting thing that a bit like a photo reporter traveling through the world and taking photos of things that one thinks are interesting or beautiful, I took photos of moments that don't exist anymore. Um, and this points to another characteristic of technology that I find fascinating, which is this constant upgrade, uh, the constant upgrade of the platform. Uh, the title Report a Problem refers to a little button in the lower left corner of the Google Street View screen. If you click on the button, you can tell Google that there is a problem in what you're visualizing and they will fix the image or they will substitute it with a better one. So in a way, these images are also fixing in time um, a specific kind of glitch, a specific technological limit that doesn't even exist anymore, but that reminds us again of a certain fallibility of technology, but also the ability of this failure to produce beauty, in my opinion, or at least produce something unexpected. So something that subverts what we are uh, waiting for. Uh, this is how the photos were then uh, presented in the large installation. Um, and I thought about presenting this project because it also shows how the same material can be used artistically in very different ways. So the second part of the trilogy entitled Michele's Story um, it's a collaboration with a person who had been in a car crash. And my idea was that of rebuilding one single story, one single human journey by reappropriating all of these fragments of images from Google Street View. Um, and these are the photos that I created, uh, the same source material, the same platform, but a different formalization. And what happens here is that in this 100 small, black and white uh, photographic fragments, which actually come from all over the world, a certain storytelling would emerge. And this storytelling would tell the story of one single person, which is exactly the opposite of how Google Street View operates. Uh, they extrapolate snippets of life from so many different people to create one thing that is somewhat dehumanized. So my idea was reappropriating this material and creating one single human story. Um, and then, sorry if I go fast, um, the third part of the trilogy entitled The Driver and the Cameras uh, focuses on another aspect of technology that I think you're probably all familiar with, which is uh, the question of human labor. Uh, the people working and that make the technologies and the technological processes possible. So something interesting with Google Street View is that you never see the car taking the pictures. And of course, you never see the driver of the car. So the famous ghost in the machine in this case, it's an actual person driving the car, bringing this camera from point A to point B and doing the labor that then produces the database. Um, and through my travels in Google Street View, I came across some very rare occurrences of photos of the driver of the car. Sometimes the camera breaks, sometimes the lenses are dirty. These people have to get closer. Again, the facial recognition fails when the face is too close to the camera. In a way, from an algorithmic perspective, the face of the driver has become the landscape. And so it's not readable as a human face. And I isolated 11 of these portraits and uh, um, 11, it's because the camera that was being used at the time had 11 lenses. And basically the third part of the 
trilogy shows these 11 portraits of the drivers. Now I'm going to quickly jump uh, six years in the future, <laughs> moving to a project that I'm still involved in. It's entitled Amazon's Cabinet of Curiosities. Uh, and it is an ongoing project. In fact, tomorrow um, uh, we will inaugurate uh, the third installment and in less than a month, the fourth one in the Contemporary Art Museum in Naples. And this project starts uh, with a commission. Um, was commissioned to create a new project on artificial intelligence. And as I did in the other cases, starting with my own virtual travels, my own uh, photographic archive, I started with an artificial intelligence that I knew, uh, Alexa. And I asked Alexa one simple question. Alexa, can you suggest a product for a new artwork? So I flipped the question of who is going to produce the artwork about artificial intelligence, asking this artificial intelligence to somehow produce the work by itself. And of course, Alexa very quickly suggested one product and added it to my Amazon cart. And by using the production budget that I was given to create this work, I acquired the first product. And of course, Alexa follows up immediately with, you may also be interested in this. And here is another product that I also acquire. And I follow up with another one and another one and another one until my entire budget is spent on Amazon's recommendations. Uh, and I'll show you what is the result of a process in which we take um, the logic of capitalism, the logic of consumism, and the algorithmic logic of this particular intelligence, artificial intelligence, at face value. Mi sono relazionato con un'intelligenza artificiale che è diventata molto comune, che è Alexa, è il virtual shopping assistant sviluppato da Amazon. L'opera nasce con una domanda, una domanda che è anche un po' ironica e provocatoria. E questa domanda era Alexa mi aiuti a scegliere un prodotto per una nuova opera d'arte. Ho poi semplicemente acquistato i prodotti che l'intelligenza artificiale aveva scelto per me. Quindi l'opera si è conclusa ad esaurimento budget e quello che si vede qui segue in realtà una logica molto precisa, che è una logica ottimizzata per un consumismo compulsivo. This is uh, one of the installations, one of the installments of this work, but the characteristic of the work is that it grows a little bit like a metaphor of capitalism itself. Every time I'm asked to present this work, the entire production budget gets absorbed by the work that keeps expanding and keeps adding products. Um, one of the things that I find uh, interesting and one of the reasons I decided to work in this particular way is that I do think that irony uh, sometimes can have a subversive uh, power and can reveal certain things in a sort of like subtle uh, or not so subtle way, but it operates transversely. And the other thing is that what I'm also interested, interested in is the most invisible aspects of technology. So not Alexa as the Amazon Echo, which you can see as part of the installation and that basically is telling uh, all the names of all the products that are part of the installation. but the algorithms that have already become part of our daily lives. Like we rely on these decision-making processes more and more. So stressing this fact for me, pushing it even in a sort of like dystopian way, it's a way of understanding what is already happening on a lower scale. And so here the sort of like dystopian question that I also want people to think about is, what happens to aesthetic choices when we rely to other systems and make choices for us? Um, if our ability to be like citizens of the world in an informed way, it's about constantly making choices and we keep giving that choice power away, uh, what happens to our ability to be free in the first place? So um, this is just some of my um, reflections with this and uh, now I'll move to the, uh, the Other Shapes of Me series. This is a, it's a series, it's a body of works. Uh, it started in 2020. Uh, it was probably 
uh, not probably, definitely the most ambitious project that I have undertaken so far. And I'm lucky to have worked with a lot of people who made it uh, possible. Um, it started with a series of fascinations that then somehow fed into this research project that culminated in a series of artworks. And one of the things that interested me was the idea of the genetic code. Uh, through my thinking about technology, I somehow got stuck on this idea that with the genetic code, we almost have a re framing of genetic life or human life even, or life in a more general sense if we want, in, sen in the sense of a code. Um, what, what is a code, of course? A code is many things. Uh, that was a sample of my saliva, which contains my genetic code. Uh, this is also a genetic code, but you can also write this information in other ways. Um, and of course, these are all digital versions of that code, which means actually, at a more basic level, uh, what we are seeing is something like this, uh, zeros and ones. So a binary code that can be translated and reformatted in many different ways. Um, I don't know if you can see it that well. Uh, but yes, if the resolution was better, you would see zeros and ones. This is what the slide should show. And this binary code, this string of zeros and ones, is actually a very old technology. So as I was wrapping my head around this idea of understanding life as a code, I also started to investigate the origin of this kind of a formatting of information. And it turns out, and maybe some of you know this already, that the first industrial machine that in a semi-automatic way could operate in a binary way was a textile loom called the Jacquard loom, a loom invented in France at the end of the 19th century. And I was very fascinated about the story of this loom, understanding this industrial machine as one of the first computers. And so I started a parallel research into this sort of like media archaeology of this technology. And of course, there are many other histories that are woven together with the history of this machine. And one of these histories has to do with female labor. Um, I started to accumulate documents, I started to uh, talk to experts, and I started to think about what to do with all of this information. And I finally had the idea that became the first work in this series, um, an idea that was that of involving my mother uh, with the tailor and asking her to starting after the genotyping of my uh, genome, asking her to use this very ancient loom to compute once again my entire genetic information as a textile. So she would have uh, worked for over a year with a jacquard loom to create something that is a bit like my genetic clone, but in a different material. And uh, of course, uh, there were a lot of technical things to figure out on how this could even be possible, how the data could be formatted, uh, what kind of technology could sustain, how long it would take, how expensive it would be. Uh, and this is why I said like it took also a big number of people to figure out how to do all of these things. Here you can see just uh, some photos of the production process, but the result of this long process was something like this uh, tapestry made of cotton. Uh, these uh, ancient looms can only go as wide as 60 centimeters. And uh, again, pushing the technology to its limits, I also tried to compress this data in the densest possible way. Uh, so trying to squeeze as much data as possible within the 60 centimeters and then uh, the whole thing would be rolled for about 80 meters uh, on the long side. And could, these machines could also use two colors. So I have one black thread and one white thread, and then I had to create the grayscale uh, pattern that could allow to encode more information within the pa pattern. And then the final work, uh, a software had to be produced for that. Uh, and so I worked with a programmer on a 
the most efficient way to squeeze this information uh, with one specific caveat, which is that I wanted the information to be reconvertible. So not simply a visualization of information where the origin of the data is then lost, but something that could be translated back to the code that I used uh, to get to the pattern. So this reconvertibility uh, in this particular work was important, but I'm going to show you also other works that are done in a slightly different way as I tested uh, as many possibilities as, as I could come up with. But this is the main uh, piece of this series, which includes the loom, it includes the textile, and it also includes a video within the loom, which uh, it's a film that documents the process. And it is a film about my mother. It's a bit like uh, a reciprocal gift within the same artwork to each other. And I try to document like the beauty and patience of this very long process. And uh, I'll show you a trailer of that film uh, in a second. Here you can see just some details of the large uh, installation, uh, which is now in the Modern Art Museum in Bologna, a place that uh, also has a symbolic value for me. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very symbolic project overall, I would say. But ge so Genesis is the film within this artwork. So think of the artwork as a triptych, but the three parts are also can also be understood by themselves. And uh, uh, I showed you a little bit of the textile. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of the film, which is part of the triptych. And then as I uh, continue to explore this idea of the convertibility of genetic codes in textiles, I also started to experiment with more modern looms. Uh, so this is a digital loom. Uh, the one that I used, uh, you saw the, uh, the part where my mom is uh, knitting together punched cards. 
So those punch cards are basically the software uh, that had to be used. But with a digital loom, of course, you can input the software in a more uh, effective way. And digital looms can also produce uh, textiles or tapestries that are a lot larger, and they can also work with more colors. So I started to work on uh, different uh, ways of encoding information using, uh, in this case, five different uh, colors. And the next series was, uh, it's called sections. Uh, and it's again, my whole code that then was a uh, section in different parts. The exhibition looks a bit like a barcode. And each section is as tall as I am tall. And all the sections together amount to the same amount of information in the first work, but it's presented in a different way. And then I um, also can show you also a few close-ups. It was basically the effect of the encoding, not something that I had uh, necessarily wanted. Um, although with every you know, conversion into an image, you always have a set of possibilities. So in the end, I also picked uh, one possibility that for me could unlock additional layers of meaning. So in this case, um, well, first of all, I used primary colors, which come with their own tradition. Uh, then the same colors that I used are also the colors used in red, green, blue, yellow uh, digital monitors. So there was that other sort of like a connection with how digital information is displayed on a screen. And then there was also this potential connection with the four bases and the sort of like background. So every time I try to, maybe this is uh, something that I should say, but I think in all of these works, in a way, I start with a certain concept or a question or a set of questions sometimes. And then it is a matter of finding a form and a method that creates a certain homology between the form and the content. And so I'm satisfied with the work when I find something that looks like a stable balance between the idea and the material of the work itself. Um, and samples was the following uh, series of small uh, scale uh, textile works. Uh, in this case, I'm not uh, looking at the convertibility or I'm not trying to squeeze all the data. I'm sometimes working from fragments of data visualizations. I'm looking at all kinds of materials without any sort of like conceptual or technical limit to what images could become the source of a tapestry. And then I'm also not giving myself any limit for what kind of textile technique I want to use to create these works. So they're all different and uh, they all use different materials. Some are organic materials, some are synthetic materials. Uh, the looms used are all different. Uh, the source, of these textiles are also all different, but within the exhibition, they serve a specific purpose, which is that of expanding this idea of how we can understand information, how we are used to read also a certain kind of content in a certain kind of image, even when there isn't that direct uh, connection between the two. And uh, I also published this artist book uh, along with um, a group of people from all kinds of fields, philosophers, historians of science and technology, uh, waivers, uh, curators, art critics. And the goal of this project was both of retelling the story of the making of the first installation, but by delving into all of the different parallel histories that I quickly mentioned. The first, the first line in the genotyping list from my genotyping. And it became both the title of the book, but it also became uh, half of the title of the large installation that I showed at the beginning. And then um, just to mention that I am um, keep expanding this project. Now I'm working towards uh, the other shapes of you, uh, um, which basically 
uses a similar softwares but different materials. For example, this is aluminum, and it translates also genetic information in other uh, patterns and images. Here you can see some details. And before closing, I see that it's time. I will just mention that um, an important part of all of this research was also a series of public programs and events and talks and conversations with uh, people in different parts of the world, people that were both involved and non-involved in the project, trying to use the project itself as a sort of like platform to create bridges that point in different directions and can also mobilitate uh, different kinds of interests, different kinds of questions. And with this, I'll close my presentation and uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you have. But thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to listen to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. One question that we got in advance, Emilio, is about um, how um, you find inspiration in scientific work. What uh, draws you to scientific data? as a, a source to make art from? I think the, the bottom line for me is that I am inspired by things that exert power over people. And uh, uh, scientific research, in a way, is fundamental for reframing both a certain understanding of what human life is, uh, also pushing in the direction of what human life may become. And it's also a very strong lens through which we understand what human life has been. And uh, these are all questions that for me are crucial. And they can be answered, of course, in a number of ways. And every discipline, uh, I think many disciplines actually attempt to answer these questions. So my inspiration is always interdisciplinary in the sense that I actually want to draw from all of these other disciplines. But then I want to reframe the questions in very specific ways. And by that, I mean working interdisciplinarily for me becomes the inspiration because it allows to produce both questions and answers that can only be asked in between different spaces. So at the crossroad of the history of technological development and art practice, a certain question emerged that our practice by itself would not be able to ask, and that the history of science and technology has ignored for a long time. So that when I find that there are these possible questions and spaces for intervention, then I feel inspired because I, I can find a way to create a discourse that hopefully gets people as excited as I get excited. Awesome. Yeah. That's a cool message. Could you just, I know you have more questions, but could you give an example of a question that fits that description. Yes. Just to repeat that question for the folks at home, sure. can you give an example of uh, something that, a question that fits one of those projects? Sorry, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's or a question that in that sense hasn't been addressed in the way that you describe. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the best way, uh, I'm going to interrupt my screenshot for a second, and I'm going to share something else. And I think that will uh, uh, probably, <laughs> I hope, answer. Uh, the question you just asked. Here you can see some uh, images from Western art history showing the creation of the first man out of clay or mud. Um, here you can see some anatomical studies of the human, most recent of which is from the, the thing from the Italian Renaissance. Here you can see some studies of motion uh, from the 17th century. And here you can see some Google results of human brain computation. Um, this is uh, straight from my dissertation, but it's something that connects also to the last project I showed you. And so what do I find when I look at these images from my perspective, which is not rooted in any specific discipline? Um, I find that for over 2000 years, and I could probably stretch it even back in time a little more, humans have explained 
their origin. They've explained what they are made of by using technological models. And so at a time when uh, clay was the most advanced technology, we have myths of Prometheus shaping the first man out of clay. Uh, the Babylonians have the same myth of Enki uh, creating the first man out of clay. In China, they have a similar myth. Uh, um, and similar myths, you can find them also in the Aboriginal people of New Zealand and in other parts of Africa. So you move in the future, in the Renaissance, and here you have a sketch by Leonardo of the Arno River near Florence, and then his anatomical study of the veins in the arm. And all of these anatomical studies suggest that they were understanding the motion of fluids within the body by using hydraulic technologies. And one century later, once mechanical technology was more advanced, you have Borelli creating this very precise drawing of human motion in terms of pulleys, um, uh, cogs, all of these mechanical elements. And of course, if we go today and we ask people, you know, what are we doing right now? We're sharing information, we're acquiring and processing information. So we're using another technological model to understand how we function and how we operate even amongst ourselves. And so my way of looking through all of these materials is finding a thorough, a true line, a line that can be, can open a new space of investigation that could be both theoretical, like I've been working on this for a few years, and there is a lot of history there, but it can also be artistic because in the last project about understanding the human as a code, it suggests that at some point the human was understood in a different way. And in fact, you know, if you had asked a person in the Renaissance, like what is a memory, they would have said that a memory is like a tapestry. It's woven together by a lot of different things. It fades out with time and it can even be ripped and broken. But if you ask now to someone what is a memory, they will say that it's information stored somewhere that you can access and retrieve unless the data gets corrupted. And it, you know, these models of understanding what we are and how we function, um, I think are best addressed when the questions are asked from this kind of like liminal spaces that are in between different disciplines, in between even different institutions, like from within a scientific institution, but partially from within an art space and partially outside of both. Um, so I hope this answers the question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and that's all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so interesting. Amelia, what in, uh, drew you to the Broad? What, um, uh, what are you interested in exploring while you're here? Yeah. Um, I think it's just a continuation of what I've been uh, describing. So I'm interested in the kind of research and the kind of knowledge that is produced by different spaces. I'm interested in the epistemology that emerges from the work of scientists, from the work of, sci of scientists and technologists. I'm interested in how people approach the idea of models. And uh, it is a very important part of scientific research today. And that's one of the reasons that I got interested in this space. It also seemed like a perfect continuation of my work on genetics and thinking about how that sort of codification of life can lead to different kinds of questions. And then I'm also interested in working at the crossroads of different spaces and what that friction can produce, what kind of inspiration can also emerge from working in this particular way. So yeah, these are uh, some of the reasons. Other questions from the room or online? Yes, Shannon. Yes. Old school question. Um, what role does visual aesthetics play in your work? I think visual aesthetics plays a huge role. Um, even just to give you a practical example, I showed these images. If I had described this myth without showing the image, the power of the message would be diminished already. 
Um, and that's just to give like a very simple answer, like how do you convey message and an idea in the most effective way? Uh, then there is the question that concepts can only go so far. So um, I have this movie that I made in 2017 called Animal Cinema, which is animals stealing cameras and filming by themselves. And the concept of understanding animal and technological life is something intertwined that at some point acts in a way that it's completely beyond our control, I can share the idea and you can all understand what's the concept. But then when you actually see those images and you feel within that flux of images, you don't simply understand the idea, but you feel it. And that's a very different form of understanding. And that's, I think, the understanding that you can only get through art and through this kind of more, let's call them immersive, for lack of a better word, uh, kind of experience. Uh, and besides that, there is also something that is afforded by art practice that it's almost impossible to achieve in other fields, which is a certain propensity for taking huge risks, making mistakes, learning from the mistakes, and not being useful. So whereas even in science, you can make errors and learn from the errors, and the errors allow the scientific research to progress, and I think that's very interesting in heart and science shared that. Then there is the question of utility. Was that useful? And art can actually have this sort of like role when the question of utility can be put aside and it can even be an afterthought. Was it useful? But it's not something that you're wondering as you are trying to make art. And a lot of people ask me like, uh, what's the utility of this kind of thing that you're doing? And there is always, the problem that there are already countless disciplines that have artistic uh, qualities like design, architecture, and they need to be useful. But if we make everything useful, we completely lose the freedom of art. And all that we have produced artistically, in a way, if it had to be reduced to utility, we would basically destroy like half of art history. Um, so uh, that's, th that's why I think art is important. Well, I think we're about at time for today. Thank you again, everyone for joining and for your thoughtful questions at home and here. And uh, snacks still in the back. Thanks again, Emilio. That Thank was you. Wonderful. Thank you.